Good morning, and thank you for joining INSA's Coffee and Conversation featuring the Honorable Christine Abizaid. Before we begin, we'd like to share a video from today's sponsor, Lidos. Now, please welcome INSA Executive Vice President, John Doyen. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for Coffee and Conversation. We're pleased to welcome one of our community's top leaders to the program today for a timely conversation on U.S. counterterrorism priorities. Before we begin, a couple of traditional housekeeping notes. If you have questions, and we hope you do, please submit them through the Q&A tool on the right side of your screen. We'll do our best to get to all of your questions. Also, we're pleased to welcome members of the press to the call today. So this is a reminder that this program is on the record. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce a long-standing friend of INSA's, Vicki Schmansky, who's the Chief Operating Officer at Lidos and a member of INSA's Board of Directors. Vicki will introduce our speaker. Vicki, over to you. Thank you, John. And I'd like to thank INSA for hosting this morning's conversation. They've done an incredible job hosting programs like today's that help keep us engaged with the issues and more importantly, connected to the broader IC community. Lidos is very proud of our current work for NCTC, providing counterterrorism analysis and maintaining and modernizing its IT systems. In fact, we've supported NCTC continually since shortly after its standup. Lidos leverages insights acquired by hundreds of prime contracts across the IC and its key competencies in analytic tradecraft and software modernization to further NCTC's very important national security mission. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker. The Honorable Christine Abizade was sworn in as director of the National Counterterrorism Center on June 29th, 2021. She's the eighth Senate confirmed director and the first woman to lead the United States counterterrorism enterprise. Ms. Abizade brings 14 years of national security experience to this position, including serving as a deputy assistant secretary of defense for Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia during the Obama administration. Prior to joining the office of the secretary of defense, she served on the NSC staff as both director for counterterrorism and Senior Policy Advisor to the Assistant to the President for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism. Most recently, she served as an executive at Dell Technologies in its Global Operations Organization, where she led supply chain assurances. Welcome, Christy. Thanks very much, Vicki. John? Hey, Vicki, uh, thank you. And Christy, glad you can join us this morning. And I'd like to also extend my uh, welcome to you and thanks for joining us. And um, to get the conversation started, um, let's start uh, back right at the beginning of July last uh, summer when you started in your new role as the director of NCTC. So thinking back to, to that time frame in summer, you know, the administration was in the midst of finalizing plans for its Afghanistan withdrawal. And uh, a month later uh, in August, as the Taliban was taking control, a number of ISIS attacks occurred killing many civilians and 13 US civil uh, service members. So I wanted to ask you, you know, this was right as you had started in your, this new role. What was it like for you to, to enter the job in a, uh, such a key moment? Uh, it, was, uh, it was remarkable. Um, you know, I, I think back to that kind of early onboarding time, I think my first week on the job uh, was about a week before um, we had left, uh, we, the United States, had had departed from Bagram. Um, and there was an intense effort across the United States government to uh, ensure that the next steps of the drawdown plan were executed effectively and that we were thinking um, very deeply about how we were going to 
um, deliver on our commitments to the partners that we had had in Afghanistan for so many years. And, you know, I came into the NCTC role understanding uh, the role that NCTC played just having been a part of the counterterrorism community for so long, but also having worked the Afghanistan mission set from, from the Pentagon seat. Um, as recently as 2016. And so um, it, it was a little surreal coming back in at that time frame because it felt like uh, I was dropping right back in where I left. Um, mm -hmm. Such an, an interesting intervening time had, had really played out. Um, you know, I would say that as I um, watched the next month and a half unfold and as we went into what was a pretty significant um, effort from the United States and the evacuation operation, what I got to experience firsthand, what I got to lead firsthand was a national counterterrorism center that was firing on all cylinders. When you think about that um, event, when you think about the um, activities that, that, that unfolded during the course of those events, you know, National Counterterrorism Center had to do its basic mission, which is protect the country, understand the strategic threat. They had to do current threat tracking. You mentioned that pretty horrific suicide attack outside the gates of HKIA. And, um, you know, our job was to understand what could be coming and provide the right kind of warning to our forces and um, to our, um, our, our customer set across the board from the president down to the boots on the ground. Um, but we were also looking at the individuals that were evacuating from Afghanistan and trying to understand what we could do to support the military operation, both getting them out of the country, um, but also making sure that we understood who was coming into the country so that we were both helping save the lives of Afghans mm -hmm who had supported us for so long, but also protecting Americans as, um, as we were keeping pace with this pretty remarkable flow of evacuees that were coming um, out of Afghanistan in the midst of a crisis. And so you know, what, I, what I experienced in that month leading up to the uh, fall of Kabul and, and in the several weeks after was really just a great deal of pride and, and really seeing firsthand the way that the whole center operated from our watch floor, from our screening and vetting team, from our threat analysts, from our IT systems partners, how we pulled together um, and, and, and really supported the objectives of the country. Now, did anything uh, surprise you uh, about at that time or was there something you wish uh, you could have done better? Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily say anything surprised me. I mean, look, uh, Every day we learned something new. Every day um, it was kind of, you know, a feat of interagency partnership to get through. And what I was really kind of amazed by was, one, seeing what a partnership across the interagency could do in a time of crisis and the way we could all function um, together to, to get through to the, the other side of the day. Um, and then for me, you know, my background in counterterrorism has been mostly on the strategic analysis side, the threat analysis side, and to actually get to understand the inner workings of our screening and vetting process in the midst of the crisis, some of which we had to build specifically to make it through the crisis was, was fascinating and, again, I would just say inspiring to see how our team pulled together to do that in support of U.S. objectives. Thank you. So, um, of course, this is the Afghanistan issues. There's been a lot of discussion uh, in the last couple of months. Um, last November, so last month, um, at the Aspen Security Forum, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Milley, uh, stated that, um, uh, in his view, Al-Qaeda and ISIS could rebuild a presence in Afghanistan in anywhere from as soon as six months to out to three years. Um, so, thinking about this, um, uh, what he said, what is your assessment uh, today of uh, the terrorism threat as you see it um, from Afghanistan? Yeah. So this is a top priority for the intelligence community is to understand what the trajectory is of the terrorist groups that operate in Afghanistan. Now, I, I'm not exactly sure what um, Chairman Milley said, but, you know, 
the the presence of terrorist actors in Afghanistan is well known. It's it was well known when um, President Biden made his decision. Um, and and the question has been, you know, what degree of threat to the homeland those terrorist actors present? And when we think about that, and you've got a really interesting milieu of bad actors that have um, exploited Afghan territory for a long time. But when we think about that from a kind of national security threat, a prioritization threat, you know, we're most concerned about ISIS-K and, and Al-Qaeda, the Al-Qaeda elements, particularly Al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, but, but all Al-Qaeda elements that could be there. Now I'd say, you know, both of those groups were really relegated to regional threats over the last several years um, in Afghanistan. I mean, ISIS-K came onto the scene relatively late, but had been decimated, not just by US pressure, but by Taliban pressure. Um, Al-Qaeda too, under constant um, a constant pressure in the region from not only the United States, but our partners, including the Afghans, the Pakistanis, and others. And, um, and, and so the question is, you know, without the persistent presence of U.S. forces on the ground, how does that, how does that threat change? And um, it, it's, uh, it's, one, going to be a key intelligence priority no matter what. But mm -hmm. as you look at how um, dramatic the unfolding of, of Afghanistan has been over the last couple of months, you know, the surprise with which um, Kabul fell and the surprise to everyone with which Kabul fell, right? Ta the Taliban is now adjusting to a new reality that they probably hadn't anticipated would be true this early on in the post-withdrawal environment. Um, Al-Qaeda and ISIS have that same sort of uh, adjust strategic adjustment they have to make to the dynamic environment that exists in Afghanistan today. And you know, we, the United States, as we look at it from an intelligence perspective, as we think about it from our own kind of counterterrorism architecture perspective, you know, we're we're all um, assessing what the dynamic threat environment will be and what we need to do to both protect the homeland from what could emerge, but also get really objective about how things are playing out on the ground uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's very clear that the Taliban sees ISIS-K as its main security threat, um, as it should. Uh, you know, they they they'll, they'll continue their fight against ISIS-K just as ISIS-K will continue to prioritize gaining territory in Afghanistan. And how that develops, and the degree to which that develops, and what impact it has on the external threat that Afghanistan may pose. It, it is our challenge as the intelligence community to stay in, on top of and not react to, but proactively position ourselves so that we can ensure that Afghanistan never again becomes a platform from which terrorists can attack us. And so when when um, you hear Chairman Milley talk about a six to 36 month timeline, by the way, it's a pretty broad range. I mean, I think that broad range really reflects the, the dynamics environment that we all find ourselves in. Um, and, you know, the degree to which um, we are all tracking very closely what could be any range of capability that these groups um, build and any range of intention they may have to not only work on their local and regional fights, but also um, look towards the West and what notoriety they could gain by being either opportunistic or more strategic about how they think about posing an external threat. Um, so uh, key, key priority for us um, in the intelligence community, like again, it was always gonna be a key priority. And I think the circumstances with which Afghanistan developed over the last several months make it a, a much more complicated dynamic to kind of set a trajectory on and, and you know have confidence in exactly which direction it's going to go so it, it, it'll be sporty for a while i think well with the u.s drawdown in afghanistan um as we know there's been so much discussion about intelligence resources shifting to focus on um china and russia so thinking about as that those shifts of, of resources and, and uh, are, are reallocated to those other priorities, what has been the impact on our nation's counterterrorism posture? Uh, so, so 
I'm glad you brought this up because I, I actually think it's actually it's one of the most important things we can do at the center and as we think about the CT enterprise broadly speaking, which is, you know, how do we ensure that the CT enterprise is functioning effectively in a way that actually allows for policymakers to focus on great power competition or other threat actors, cybersecurity. Uh, the other myriad of challenges that we have as a as a national security team um, and counterterrorism is always going to be kind of a baseline requirement of what we do to secure the country and protect the nation and if you look at what we've built over the last 20 years i mean we've got an infrastructure we've got collaboration mechanisms we've got partnerships both local and global that are mature and allow us to do that mission really well and so from a counterterrorism perspective what we need to do is make sure we execute excellently across the ct enterprise building on all of the lessons learned over the last 20 years including what those lessons mean for how we optimize for the future and and do that work in a way that allows us to um, as a country focus on other priorities as well so for me, I, you know, I, I want to make sure that the that we don't lose in the conversation about great power competition, that counterterrorism is still a top priority and is actually kind of foundational to our ability to do all the other things that are really important to us. And as we talk about resources and we talk about, um, you know, the way in which we want to posture for the future on those other threats, you know, we've got to make sure that we preserve what works and that we learn lessons and get better and more efficient and effective at how we do that. And, you know, I mean, um, Vicki was generous to introduce me earlier today, but I, I, I think technology's gotta be a part of that solution. And so, um, you know, when I think about my role as the director of the National Counterterrorism Center, and I think about the time in which I enter this role and what we're looking at in the next evolution of the threat, to me, what's really critical is making sure that you know we're being deliberate about navigating the CT enterprise into that next decade in a way that actually enables us to pursue all kinds of national security priorities in addition to counterterrorism. Right. Yeah, you've mentioned it's, it's been 20 years, so the past 20 years since 9-11. Um, uh, a lot has been put into place uh, across the U.S. to prevent foreign terrorist attacks. Um, but, but you know, every day is a, you get a fresh look at what the landscape looks like. So I wanted to ask you, you know, you know looking out today, um, what does NCTC see as, as the emerging threats and the threats that are of concern um, to the U.S. at this time? So. The counterterrorism environment and the threat landscape in general, which is really what you're asking about, it's very different than you know where we were 20 years ago. I mean, where we were 20 years ago um, was really focused on a concentrated threat that was emerging from the AFPAC area and um, has since metastasized in multiple different ways, not only through uh, affiliate networks associated with Al Qaeda popping up in other areas, but also the advent of ISIS core um, and the many ISIS branches that have now, um, you know, in some cases gone from a local insurgency to a global one just through the brand of ISIS alone. And what that's created is, is a pretty geographically diverse and diffuse uh, threat environment. And, and We've got to be really careful in this kind of breadth of a threat environment to understand where that threat environment presents the most strategic threat to the United States, um, to the United States homeland, to our citizens overseas. And, and, and just because that kind of swath of territory goes from West Africa uh, across to South Asia and even into Southeast Asia, it, it doesn't mean that all of those areas actually present the same kind of threat to the United States. And so, you know, for me, as we look at um, where we need to be focused as a counterterrorism community, we really need to understand those places where the threat is most likely to be kind of, um, adjust from a local and regional threat to one that has 
a, a, a transnational implication, that one that becomes an external or even direct threat to the homeland. And so that's where we need to get prioritized about this broad swath of territory and what matters in it. And that's really what, you know, I mean, that's really kind of mostly about the global jihad. It's mostly about our, our, our concerns around ISIS, Al Qaeda, and kind of those ideological bedfellows. But if you look at the actual threat inside the homeland, um, and I think this is probably true for much of Western Europe as well, the threat is primarily from lone actors. Um, lone actors motivated by a variety of ideologies, um, but that are, are hard to detect, that um, can kind of bring a range of sophistication and impact, even if it's a relatively unsophisticated tactic that they choose to use. Um, and that presents real challenges for local law enforcement, for our uh, ho lead homeland security, uh, elements for the FBI. I know Director Reyes testified quite a bit about just how difficult this challenge of preventing lone actor attacks is. Uh, and and it, it really requires a level of communication and coordination inside the United States from state, local, tribal, territorial authorities all the way up to the national level to make sure that we have a good understanding of what could come at us and we're being proactive about how we can um, uh, understand when individuals are mobilizing to violence. In fact, one of the uh, one of the key products that we work on jointly with DHS and FBI is a mobilization indicators booklet that um, has real impact on the ground as as local law enforcement is trying to understand, you know, a, 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 you know, when an individual actually presents a threat to the community. And so that that lone actor threat is um, is persistent. It is vexing. It is much different than the hierarchical, strategically, centrally directed plotting that we saw in the aftermath of 9/11. Thanks. Yeah, one more Afghanistan question, and then we'll go go to some others. Um, and as you see on the screen, uh, if you have questions out there in our audience, please send them in. And in fact, I'm going to. Uh, uh, pick an audience question right now, and it's from one of our uh, uh, INSA uh, senior advisors, Charlie Allen. Uh, many people know Charlie. Uh, and he asks, how confident are you that U.S. intelligence in the future will be able to track ISIS-K plotting from Afghanistan and the tribal areas of Pakistan? So, Charlie, thank you for the question. I mean, this isn't just a, a comment about Afghanistan, but I would say in general, I'm very concerned about uh, terrorists' use of encrypted technologies, terrorists' increasingly effective operational security measures. You know, I, I, maybe this is just the curse of any counterterrorism professional, but I'm really concerned about what we don't see. And that's um, that's going to be true for any of the theaters in which we have uh, actors that we know have aspirations against the United States. Um, and whether those aspirations are actually becoming a capability that they're seeing through, um, you know, I, I, that, that, is, that is always going to be kind of the, the world of a counterterrorism analyst, which is, um, you know, what do we not know about the threat that could be coming at us? Um, for Afghanistan, you know, the, the story is the same. And Afghanistan today is very, is going to be and necessarily will be a very different collection environment than it was for the last 20 years. We don't, we don't have boots on the ground. We don't have the infrastructure that came with those boots. We don't have uh, the intelligence collection mission that uh, needed to exist in the time frame that we had a presence active in Afghanistan. And so, um, it, we're, we're not going to have the level of insight that we did when we had a, a major presence and a major military mission inside of Afghanistan. And, and that's the job of the intelligence community going forward. And it's something that we've been focused on for a long time, which is how do we make sure that the most strategic threats that exist in and from Afghanistan are the ones where we train our uh, intelligence resources against. And that's a comment on the kind of human focus that we need to reimagine for Afghanistan, um, but also all the national technical collection that we need to think about, ISR coverage, et cetera. So, you know, um, the, 
there, there's been a lot of conversation publicly about an over the horizon capability for counterterrorism vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan. You know, I like to actually think of it a little bit differently, which is that you know, we in the intelligence community and the operational community have to build a CT architecture that ensures that we're able to um, detect and protect against threats that emerge from that area. And that's not just a statement about what we need to be able to, to see inside the networks in Afghanistan, to see inside the borders of Afghanistan, but it's about the transregional enablers, it's about kind of facilitation routes, it's, it, it, it's about uh, a, a very sophisticated intelligence approach that, um, that we haven't had to employ in the same way over the last 20 years because uh, our presence allowed us to, to do different things. And so that's going to be the key task of the intelligence community going forward. It's building that CT architecture and that intelligence and warning indications and warning architecture, not just for Afghanistan, but but across the board, that cues us to those things that uh, that could threaten us. Um, we have another question in. Uh, this one is from Eric Schmidt with the New York Times. Um, and it pertains to some of our allies and what they're doing. You know, the US is not the only one shifting its uh, counterterrorism resources. And he asked, how will the reduction of French forces um, that are in, in Northern Africa from the Barkhane operation in the Sahel, how will that reduction impact counterterrorism efforts there? Is that something to be concerned about? The French CT effort in, in the Sahel is, um, is a, a, a really important part of the counterterrorism architecture that we have globally. And, and you know, um, Eric, you know this just as well as anyone, um, you know, that's not just a statement about US capability, it's a statement about the coalitions, the partnerships, the collaborations, whether operational or intelligence, that um, are gonna be essential to, uh, to make sure we train on the threats that could most likely threaten all of us. Um, and so the French CT operations over the last many years ha have been a really important part of deterring the kind of inflection point of that regional to transnational threat that we have always been concerned about out of the Sahel. Um, and making sure that whatever French national decisions are made, that we think about what needs to happen in that region from a coalition standpoint, from a counterterrorism partnership standpoint. We need to think about it not just um, in terms of either the French or the US, but also our local partners and what kind of support our local partners need from an intelligence perspective, from um, a you know capacity building or even basic governance structure perspective that that we can provide, and so um, as we as we look at kind of where the terrorism landscape is going, the trajectory of terrorist actors, um, particularly JNM, but others in that region, and the work that we need to do to make sure that that regional threat does not become transnational. Um, that that's going to be an um, the partnership piece is going to be important. And if in if a French decision means that they have to adjust, then we've got to figure out how we adjust around that. Let me ask you uh, shift the question the uh, topic a little bit to domestic violent extremism. So I know this past March, um, Odie and I released a report uh, discussing uh, the title was "Domestic Violent Extremism Poses a Heightened." threat in 2021. Um, so could you describe um, a little bit uh, uh, what in CTC's role is right now? I know also the DNI, uh, we had a comment here from uh, Ellen Lakeson who's, who mentioned that the DNI had uh, recently said, talked about uh, NCTC does have statutory authorities that would permit uh, the center to cover domestic terrorism and to collaborate with FBI DHS and others uh, on that threat. Um, where where are we in that uh, that whole issue of how NCTC is partnering with other parts of the government, and what are you doing with uh, in regards to domestic violent extremism? So the the centers got an effort on domestic violent extremism, and we do it um, very in very close collaboration with, and really in support of the lead Homeland Operating Agencies, FBI and DHS. Um, we've got a couple of efforts here that make sure that that kind of joint tri-seal collaboration, particularly on this kind of domestic, um, this domestic challenge is one that that is seamless. 
Um, but but the the authorities that DNI the DNI mentioned are absolutely essential to our ability to play that role. I mean, um, this audience knows better than most the degree to which the intelligence community is not trained on the United States, and so um, and yet we we have issues like terrorism. There are probably other issues where this kind of um, question of borders, um, the way in which different threat actors exploit those borders, and um, you know how we as a national security community make sure those strategic threats are protected against, um, you know, the, the way in which we, the National Counterterrorism Center, need to focus on the domestic threat in support of our, our lead homeland agencies is, is a really important challenge for us going forward. Now we we um, co-authored that assessment that you mentioned, and um, I, I think you know it reflects a very balanced view of the kinds of ways that domestic actors, and here we're talking about those actors that um, are are operating primarily in the United States without kind of um, inspiration or specific direction from foreign terrorist groups or foreign powers. What what kind of what kind of national security challenge those domestic actors present? Whether it's racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, um, you know, anti-government, anti-authority extremists, um, animal rights extremists, abortion, those on either side of the abortion equation. I mean, we've got a, a lot of different ways in which this kind of um, domestic uh, threat has manifested itself over the last many years. And as we saw the spike in particularly racially and ethnically motivated violent extremist attacks, uh, it was clear that the kind of strategic analysis that NCTC could support both the FBI and DHS on, that that, that was in high demand. And so uh, several years ago, we started working much more closely with our partners to not just think about the international terrorism domain, but also make sure that we were applying what we understood in that domain to the domestic violent extremist problem uh, in a way that best supported our partners on the ground. Um, and so the we do have that kind of unique statutory authority to do that. But I would I would be really clear that we do that, you know, in a supporting role. And there are lots of good reasons for why we need to do it in a supporting role and lots of ways in which in that support, we have to be very careful about privacy, civil liberties, and making sure that um, the way in which we approach the, the domestic threat is not necessarily the exact same way we would approach that international threat. And so um, making sure that we're very refined and consistent and responsive in the way in which we think about DVE, the, the domestic violent extremist landscape, uh, it is just a really critical part of how the center needs to do things a little bit differently to evolve with the way that the overall threat is evolving. So um, I've been really impressed to see the way in which we collaborate across our, our key agencies. Um, and, you know, I, I think there are other ways in which we can do it uh, in a way that provides strategic level insights into what's happening across the country and, and gives policymakers the kind of guidance they need to think about how they make their domestic violent extremist strategy a real, have real impact. Right. Um, we're starting to get lots of questions in, uh, Christy, so that's always great. Um, and one, you had mentioned a little earlier, uh, talking about um, yourself uh, becoming more familiar with NCTC's screening and vetting mission. And we have a question, um, does NCTC still play a role in watch listing? And then another question um, from uh, related to that, uh, Steve Harvey from National Security Solutions asked, can you discuss how biometrics and identity uh, uh, access management is part of your strategy. Yeah, um, uh, the, the fact that I'm generating a lot of questions, by the way, makes me a little bit nervous, but that's okay. Um, so um, the, um, the, the screening and vetting work that we're doing uh, is really pretty phenomenal. And when I think about like the way in which uh, technology is gonna help us, the intelligence community, um, going forward to really get specific, not uh, not about kind of 
uh, general threats, but about specific individuals that we need to be concerned about. And uh, technology is just at the heart of the strategy that we need to employ. So, um, and, and you know this just from your time at NCTC, how important the technological piece of the screening and vetting enterprise um, that supports the watch, list, watch listing mission, that supports those adjudicating agencies at State Department and at DHS and otherwise as they make determinations about what individuals should or shouldn't be watch listed. You know, um, all of that is really dependent on a very sophisticated intelligence backbone that is, um, that uh, has is able to take the data that we have in the intelligence realm and make the most use of it to get to the cleanest, um, most refined decisions around identities intelligence possible. Um, again, that's an information input to those that are, are involved in watch listing, but it's a really important one that we get right, not just from a screening and vetting perspective, but also from a world of threat detection and threat prevention um, outside of the screening and vetting world. The you know, counterterrorism analysis is, is um, both strate strategic and tactical at the same time because it's fundamentally about individuals that seek to do us harm. And so um, the way in which biometrics becomes a part of that kind of refined identity intelligence mission, the way in which we connect the government databases, the IC databases in a way that gets us faster to insights, that allows us to go not just to, from data points, but to actually data points that are usable that actually help us prevent a threat. Uh, that's a critical piece of our technology modernization mission going forward. And so I think we, we've, we've uh, as, as I've seen it kind of uh, in real time, I think we've uh, developed a, quite an architecture over the last many years uh, in this realm of identity intelligence. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to get more sophisticated and really develop insights faster in a way that that protects the country in real time. As you look to technology to help you with some of these mission sets and challenges, um, uh, are you able to use uh, artificial intelligence and, and other analytic tools uh, uh, in, as you, you work through that? And um, how can we always get this question from our industry partners? How can industry help? We also have a question here from a um, uh, uh, a colleague at uh, Fordham University who directs their Center for Cybersecurity, which is how can academia uh, help and how can academic institutions help? So um, AI, machine learning, you know, natural language, language processing, all of the kind of big data techniques, um, the way in which we kind of bring the, the technology to the information that we have at our fingertips, that, that's that's essential going forward. Um, so it's absolutely part of the strategy. And, and I think you've seen not just NCTC, but the IC writ large really emphasize the need for data literacy, data scientists, um, and, and thinking about the way in which we exploit the data we have uh, to the to the national security threats that we're most interested in. You know, I, I've been really impressed by seeing our data analytics groups, our data scientists, work on some hard problems, some of those in real-time crisis, some of those kind of longer thread. And um, I, I think the insight that they are able to provide to what uh, can be traditional analysis uh, that is not data-informed or data-driven, it, it, it's, it's invaluable, and I think it's the way of the future. So we as an intelligence company not, not only need the technologies and the interfaces and the sophisticated techniques to apply to um, our analysis, but we also, each of us as intelligence officers need to actually think of that technology and think of data usage and, and data infused analysis as part of our job. And I think that's a, still a culture shift underway in the intelligence community. You know, my experience in the private sector, depending on what company you're, you're from, you know, some of that kind of fused 
um, nature of your technology professionals and, and your substantive professionals, you know, that's coming along. I really think that we in the intelligence community need to embrace it and encourage it. And so, um, so I'm really interested in the way in which we can innovate to be more effective using the state of the art technologies and um, systems and tools that exist. And, 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 and while I say that, I would also say that we still have to have a very strong foundation, technologically speaking, and we 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 can do some work to make that foundation stronger. Um, there is a lot of um, you know legacy technical debt. There is a lot about government agencies and boutique solutions that are created for boutique mission sets that just create um, you know a sea of um, uh, of, of systems that either need to be navigated to get your job done or need to be disaggregated to understand what's really happening. And we've just got to get to a much more seamless data exploitation environment so that we can do more work in a much more efficient, effective way to get the insights we need to protect the country. And so while I am very, very interested in kind of innovative technologies and the way in which we're already applying AI, ML, and, and, and techniques like that. I also think there's a fundamental piece here that's about the health of our IT systems that we need to be really attentive to. And you know, as I think of my priorities coming on board as the director, I've got to make sure that I don't let the IT work be the work of my IT team alone. It's got to be yeah. my team. And so um, working really closely with with Lidos and our other partners that are here as part of the NCTC community is, is to me an essential part of what's going to make this center successful long term and so it's got to be a, an essential part of my job. Okay. Um, we have a question here from John Landers at Oak Ridge National Laboratory who asked a CBRN related question and he wants to know um, what research is needed to mitigate threats of terrorist extremists accessing and using CBRN weapons? Um, so, so this, we'll take anything we can get. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, I, I mean, look, uh, terrorist use of CBRN technology, CBRN um, weapons is uh, is a major concern, and for those areas on different battlefields where we've seen certain threat actors use, you know, sulfur mustard or, or other kinds of, uh, of these agents, you know, all it does is give us a concern about how those could be employed, not just on the battlefield, but in, in other environments. And so, um, you know, the degree to which we can better understand that, better anticipate who has the technology or, or who has the, the, the know-how and the knowledge and the expertise and whether they're trying to proliferate that expertise, you know, all of that is really critical for us to prevent a, a really strategic threat from emerging. And so, you know, uh, the terrorism CBRN uh, nexus has always been a top priority in um, in the way in which we approach our CT fight. It remains a top priority, and anything the academic community can do to provide us insight into um, the ways in which these techniques could proliferate, or the kinds of places that we need to be particularly uh, mindful of in terms of a warning perspective, that's always going to be welcome. Great. Hey, we have time for one last question, and that's simply. Um, What's your outlook for the year ahead as far as your priorities or your concerns? Um, uh, anything uh, uh, in particular as you look into 2022 that's at the top of your list? Um, well, look, uh, first and foremost, the National Counters Terrorism Center needs to execute what it was built for, which is protect the nation. You know, are we, um, are we connecting the dots? Are we pulling every single thread, no matter how, um, you know, no matter the credibility of the information we have, have we dug as deep as we can to understand whether there are um, bad actors looking to threaten the United States? Mm -hmm. You've got to execute excellently. And so the number one thing to do is that. And my job as the director is to make sure that we have the systems and tools to do that. We have the partnerships to do that. We have the intelligence collection to do that and enabling our very, very good analysts to do the work of the center 
uh, is my top priority. And so thinking about ways in which we can be better um, organized, thinking about the health of our staff and the morale of our workforce, all of that is in service to that fundamental goal of protecting the nation. And I'm really proud to be a part of a center that is so passionate about the work that they do and so compelled by the mission that they have. So, um, you know, you as having been part of it in the past know what I'm talking about. This is a special place and um, and it's just, uh, it, it's really an honor to be here. Uh, NCTC really is, is a model for how to do a mission well across government. And um, thank you. Uh, Christy, so much for joining us today, and especially for all of your thoughtful and candid insights. And to everyone who's joined us online today, we want to thank you as well for taking time to join us. Um, when this webinar ends, there will be a short survey that pops up. Please take a few moments to complete it and let us know how we did. And looking ahead, we have one more event this calendar year, which will be next Thursday, December 9th when we travel to Fort Meade for networking and a lively panel discussion focused on sharing cyber threat intelligence and attack information with NSA's Cybersecurity Collaboration Center. We hope you'll be, able, be there and be able to join us. And on behalf of INSA, thank you for joining us uh, today. We hope you have a safe and joyful holiday season. This concludes today's program. Have a great day.